so I'm going to share with you, as Lorena mentioned, uh, some of my research focusing on friendship and dementia. So this is a smaller piece of a larger study. Uh, and I just want to acknowledge my collaborators, Dr. Colleen White at Brock University and Dr. Darla Fortune at Concordia University. Uh, this was very much a, a collaboration between the three of us. And uh, I just also want to acknowledge that the, the research was funded by the Social Sciences and Humanities Council of Canada. So before I go too far, you know, as a qualitative researcher, we talk about um, acknowledging our position and sharing a little bit about ourselves and how we kind of got to the research question. So I just wanted to tell you a little bit about uh, the research team and uh, how we kind of ended up at uh, doing this study focusing on friendship and dementia. So the three of us are all therapeutic recreation educators at our respective universities and we're all leisure and aging researchers. So we all have a, a strong interest in uh, better understanding how participation in meaningful leisure can contribute to quality of life among uh, marginalized older adults. We all also have experience working in long term care uh, in recreation, uh, you know, different lengths of time of experience, um, but we all, all um, have kind of before we did our PhDs, that's that's where we were was working in long term care. And so because of those experiences in long term care, we uh, that adds to our, our passion for really understanding how to improve quality of life among older adults. Uh, and we also have a shared understand or a shared focus on a desire to understand more about what it's like to live with dementia and how quality of life can be improved in dementia. So because of these uh, combined interests and, and our shared training as well as graduate students, we really wanted to work together on a study that uh, we thought would have some meaningful results for people who are living with dementia. Uh, but more than that, we are also friends. And I, I think that's important to mention in a study looking at friendship. Uh, I know over the past few years, um, this study has made me reflect on my own friendship. So I think I would be remiss if I didn't acknowledge that we have uh, a shared graduate school experience. Um, we don't see each other very often, mostly at conferences now. Uh, but uh, Darla and Colleen have really become an important support system over the years and particularly during COVID-19 as a, a great way to share ideas about teaching and, and all sorts of things during uh, these challenging times. So I did just want to acknowledge that not only are we collaborators, but we're also uh, good friends. So while I was creating this presentation, um, it kind of felt weird to say some of the, th the things that I'm gonna say um, because of the current situation with the pandemic. And um, this research was conducted uh, before, like we collected the data and analyzed the data before the pandemic hit. So what I'm gonna share to you today really reflects that uh, pre-COVID-19 world and hopefully will relate to a post-COVID-19 world as well, uh, where um, people can see their friends again, you know, and particularly with people with dementia who are uh, more vulnerable than than other people in our society, they may be experiencing quite a bit of social isolation right now. And especially living in long term care or assisted living, they're likely not having opportunities to visit their friends right now. Uh, so I know that those visitor restrictions are in place. You know, um, some people might only be allowed to have one person visit them. I think in, in Saskatchewan right now, I don't think there are any visitors in long-term care. So not all of our participants were in long-term care, uh, but I just think it's important to note that um, I'm recognizing that these challenges kind of are increased with, with COVID-19 and that staying in touch with friends is much more difficult for older adults, uh, particularly if they don't have access to technology or know how to use it. So with that, I'll dive into the background of the study. So uh, dementia is an umbrella term that refers to a variety of conditions or a set of symptoms that, affect, uh, that cause, sorry, the symptoms are caused by particular disorders that affect the brain. 
Uh, so Alzheimer's disease is uh, one of the most common types of dementia. There are other types as well uh, that I've listed on the slide there for you. Uh, these are just a few. There are, there are others as well. But generally speaking, and, and symptoms differ from person to person and, and based on the type of dementia. But generally speaking, uh, symptoms include memory loss, changes in behavior or mood, and difficulties with problem solving, thinking things through, uh, and also language. So having trouble word finding, uh, maybe in the early stages might be difficult for people living with dementia. They may lose language uh, completely in the late stages of dementia. So there is some normal memory loss with age. Uh, we can all expect to experience some memory loss, but one way I think of distinguishing between uh, normal memory loss and dementia is, you know, you lose your keys. We all lose our keys. I certainly lose mine in my purse or my office at work when I'm there all the time. Um, but if I found my keys in the freezer, which would never be a spot that I would normally put my keys, that might be a sign that there is more going on than simply a normal age-related memory loss. So why did we want to focus on friendship and dementia? Well, the rate of dementia is increasing as our population ages. And according to the Alzheimer's Society of Canada, there are currently 500,000 Canadians today who are living with dementia. And uh, by 2030, that's expected to grow to 912,000. And about 25,000 Canadians are diagnosed each year. So we know that uh, we need to have better supports for people with dementia and to have experienced quality of life and meaningful lives after a diagnosis of dementia. We also know from the research that older adults uh, are at greater risk of social isolation and people with dementia and other chronic conditions are at even greater risk than other older adults. Uh, this increased risk may be in part due to dementia-related stigma, which excludes people uh, living with dementia from active participation in everyday life. And uh, when people experience stigma, they may internalize it and they may withdraw from their friendships uh, or their friends may turn away from them. So the Alzheimer's Society of Canada uh, did a study on stigma and dementia recently, and they found that 61% of people who experience dementia have reported being ignored or dismissed by others. 60% have reported not having access to appropriate supports or services, and 59 feel that they've been taken advantage of. In addition, 54% of people in general believe that other people would avoid them or reject them if they were ever diagnosed with dementia. So stigma is a pretty big concern in dementia, and I'm going to talk about that a little bit further here. So stigma associated with dementia can uh, lead to negative emotions and may lead to the exclusion of, of people living with dementia from every uh, So this quote, this leak quote that I have here from uh, Mitchell and colleagues really highlights uh, the tragedy discourse that our society holds about dementia. Uh, that assumes that when a person is diagnosed with dementia, they no longer experience meaning, meaning in life and are turned in Mitchell, uh, Mitchell and colleagues' words into the living dead. So this discourse leads to a loss of self-worth as well as feelings of shame, guilt, isolation, and abandonment among people who are diagnosed with dementia. And as such, that diagnosis can have a negative impact on relationships, including decreased interaction and involvement with family and friends. So although we know that um, dementia is a common experience and can be very isolating for people who are diagnosed with an illness causing dementia, we also know that there, there's hope after a diagnosis of dementia. And many people with dementia do um, continue to have meaningful lives after a diagnosis. Uh, people have the same wishes and needs that they did before a diagnosis, and they still value meaningful connections with others, engagement in, in meaningful activities. And they also want to be able to make a contribution to the lives of others, just like they did before they were diagnosed with dementia. 
While friends often find it difficult to witness changes resulting from dementia and therefore withdraw from a friendship, friends who do stick around play an important role in the support networks of people who are living with dementia. Mutually rewarding friendships may become meaningful following diagnosis, particularly because of that stigma associating the, uh, associated with dementia. So Harris uh, has done some really interesting work around long-term friendships and dementia. Uh, and in doing so, she provides some insight into friendship uh, and dementia. And so she did some interviews with people living with early stage dementia in 2011, and she found that there was a need for meaningful social connectedness. And when people with dementia were valued and respected, uh, as persons by their friends, these friendships were in fact particularly meaningful. And Harris followed that up in 2013 with an additional study where she conducted focus groups with people living with dementia and their care partners, uh, followed by interviews with friends. And the findings of that study tell us that while some friends do feel uncomfortable, other long-term friends are committed to the relationship after a diagnosis. And again, they focus on the person with dementia as a friend rather than the diagnosis. And with these friendships, there's a display of reciprocity, acceptance, and loyalty. So Perriam and Steiner's more recent research also shed some additional insight into the value of friendship for people living with dementia. They found that the length of the relationship was important to sustaining a friendship after a diagnosis, and longtime friends were able to provide support, but also had that shared history that contributed to feelings of trust between the friends. Perrion and Steiner also found that reciprocity was valued among the participants, so it wasn't just a one-way relationship. There was acknowledgement that both friends benefited from the relationship. And that led to positive feelings, particularly as being able to help your friend is a nice way to show appreciation and experience purpose. And receiving help from a friend if someone has dementia can also lead to positive feelings and a sense of appreciation. Finally, with Perrion and Steiner's findings, they uh, found that there, these friendships, these long-term uh, reciprocal friendships led to feelings of security among people living with dementia. So we know that the research suggests that living with uh, people living with dementia continue to experience uh, valuable and, and meaningful reciprocal relationships. However, we don't know very much about how people with dementia and their friends actually maintain these friendships. So that's what I'm gonna to try to answer a little bit here today. So that brings me to the purpose of today's presentation and purpose of part of this, this larger study uh, was to really understand the strategies that people who are living with dementia and their friends use to sustain a friendship after a diagnosis. So for this research, we adopted a constructivist approach uh, or epistemology or worldview. Uh, and a constructivist approach holds that knowledge is created through discussion with others. And this approach was particularly important, I think, for this particular study uh, because it privileges the voices of people who are impacted most, so people living with dementia and their friends. And it was also useful because uh, we wanted to hear from people with dementia and their friends together uh, to reflect on their friendships as a pair. And, and I'll talk about some of the challenges about that in a second, but kind of how they construct their friendship as a dyad was uh, we viewed as being important to understand. Uh, we also adopted phenomenology as our methodology. So we were interested in exploring lived experience and therefore we asked our participants what their experiences were like uh, of friendship after a diagnosis of dementia. So the data were collected through uh, interviews. Uh, they were conversational interviews asking our participants to describe their friendship and, and talk about what was going well in their friendship. So we took a, a bit of a strengths-based approach to this research uh, where instead of focusing on 
what was going wrong in friendships, we focused on what was going right. Uh, we set out initially to interview uh, pairs of friends. So what we wanted to do was interview um, the person with dementia and their friend together to kind of learn how they construct that experience of friendship together. Uh, but we really struggled with our participant uh, recruitment and we had to be really flexible with the way that we collected our data. So in the end, we did uh, individual interviews uh, we did. We were able to do some diet interviews with the friend and the person living with dementia. We also did diet interviews with a person living with dementia and a, a care partner, such as a spouse or an adult child. Uh, and we had two group interviews uh, where uh, we were fortunate to have uh, a couple of people with dementia who had quite strong support networks of friends and those groups of friends wanted to be interviewed together and we were happy to accommodate that. So in the end, we did 10 individual interviews, 11 dyad interviews, and then the two group interviews. We analyzed the data using thematic analysis uh, as outlined by Braun and Clark. So we recorded the interviews and transcribed them verbatim. And then we, um, we read the transcripts multiple times to get a sense of the data as a whole. And then we engaged in uh, initial coding or line by line coding where we went through uh, kind of line by sentence by sentence and gave each sentence a, a name or a code. And then we organized those codes into themes and sub themes, which I'll share with you in a minute in a couple of slides here. So we recruited participants through, uh, we tried to recruit participants through Alzheimer's Society chapters in our respective locations. Um, that recruitment proved pretty challenging. So we used other contexts that we had in our communities as well, um, long-term care contacts, people who are working in assisted living um, in addition to uh, the Alzheimer's Society. Um, we initially set out to recruit a diverse sample with people who were living in the community, people who were living in assisted living, and people who were living in long-term care. But again, that was one of the challenges we came up against in our participant recruitment. So most of our participants uh, living with dementia, we had 13 in total, 11 of them were living in the community and two of them were living in assisted living. We interviewed 19 friends, again, because of those group interviews, we had a higher number of friends than people living with dementia. And then we had eight family members who wanted to participate as well. And we were flexible to allow them to do that. Uh, with the, the, we did not interview any people living with dementia in long-term care, but we did interview uh, two family members and two friends of people who were living in long-term care. So we were able to get a little bit of perspective on friendship after a move into a long-term care facility. So overall, our friendships uh, were pretty, pretty lengthy, although there was one that was just two years in length. Uh, many of them were more than 20 years uh, and many in even and even more than 30. So these were people who had, had been through a lot already with their friends, uh, you know, uh, worked together or raised their kids together, coached their kids' baseball teams together, that kind of thing. So they did have quite a significant shared history, many of them. Some, some of the friendships had been shorter. So moving into the findings of the study, uh, through our data analysis process, we generated several themes. And one of these themes focused on the strategies that participants used to sustain their friendships. So this overarching theme, which uh, is entitled Weathering Change, described how participants used these strategies to maintain friendship through the changes that dementia brings. Um, and, and through the pro progression of dementia as well. So there were three main groups of strategies that characterized weathering change. And these were prioritizing friendship, shifting ways of thinking about my friend and our relationship, and adopting practical strategies to address change. I'm gonna, these have a lot of sub-themes. So this will be the, the bulk of my presentation. I'm gonna go through um, each of these 
themes and their related sub themes. And uh, it's, it's rare to have an opportunity to share all the findings at once like this. Uh, so it's nice to have these KHS research seminars that are a little bit longer to be able to do that. So the first theme I'm gonna share with you was about prioritizing friendship. And this theme refers to the participants' efforts to nurture their friendships and ensure that ties were not broken in the face of a great deal of change. The participants identified several ways of prioritizing their friendship, including checking in with each other, spending time together, and engaging in acts of reciprocity. So people living with dementia and their friends periodically checked in with each other, and these simple acts of maintaining contact just like simple regular phone calls or dropping in for a quick visit enabled the friendships to continue to flourish. So checking in with each other allowed the participants to balance their busy schedules with opportunities for connection in between longer visits. So on the slide here is a quote from Faye and Faye was in a unique situation in that she was living in assisted living uh, and her friend also happened to have a room in the same assisted living home. And here Faye is emphasizing just how important keeping in touch was, even though they were living in the same place, it wasn't always easy for them to visit each other uh, because they, they were busy with other things. So she really just emphasized that, you know, we just try to get together once in a while, even if it's just to say hello in the hallway. But spending time together, those you know, longer time periods where people are engaging in a meaningful activity together was also really important for prioritizing a friendship in dementia. Um, and it helps them, yeah, it helps them to prioritize their friendship. Uh, we know that spending time together is a hallmark of any friendship, but for our participants, it was particularly valued as a way of creating normalcy and a way of creating an escape from dementia as they focused on each other and just regular life. So these two quotes here show how just spending time together in a really simple activity was pleasurable and meaningful. They highlight, on how, they highlight how participants focused on each other and not the diagnosis. So we have um, Sarah just, we just go for a coffee and talk about the family. We don't talk about dementia. And Chloe uh, was in a group of friends um, just saying, you know, I love being in her presence, sitting and having a cup of tea with her or whatever. So again, it didn't have to be uh, a, a complicated or, you know, it could just really be a simple activity as a way of spending time together. The third sub theme under prioritizing friendship was engaging in acts of reciprocity. So uh, acknowledging the give and take of the friendships was really important for the participants and they valued the meaningful contributions that their friends made in each other's lives. They drew on each other's strengths to support one another. And here we have uh, an exchange from Janet and Kathleen and Janet and Kathleen were interviewed together um, and they had been friends for over 30 years uh, and they were still, they still really relied on each other to help each other out. So, you know, Janet knew that even though her friend Kathleen had dementia, she knew that she could rely on Kathleen if she needed to. Uh, and Kathleen knew that she could rely on Janet to help her out if she was having challenges with her memory. So Janet kind of ends there with, you know, she phones if she needs something and I phone if I need something. So you can really see that the relationship continued to be reciprocal, even with the changes in memory. So the second major theme that provided insight into how the participants weathered change described how the participants reframed or changed the way they thought about their friend and the relationship. So this theme includes five sub-themes uh, that highlight the strategies that more often used by friends without dementia, uh, used to sustain the friendship over time. So the first uh, theme under shifting ways of thinking about our friendship was um, being accepting of change and accepting the changes that were occurring within the friend who was diagnosed with dementia was an important strategy. 
acknowledging that changes are occurring that may alter interactions with one's friend and being able to adjust to the individual's ability and perspective was necessary in order to be able to accept these changes. So here on the slide, we have three quotes from friends who spoke about the importance of accepting their friend as they were now. Carol accepted her friend Patty when she made mistakes and she refrained from correcting them. Similarly, Gloria learned to accept that her friend Faye didn't always remember their visits with each other. Acceptance was more likely to happen when friends didn't dwell on the changes. But in mid and later stages of dementia, acceptance was more challenging since those changes were more pronounced. Chloe here is highlighting the important, the, the important aspects of learning to accept a friend with dementia as they were currently and living in the moment. So reminding oneself that the friendship was still valuable even though it had changed was an important part of accepting one's friend. So while friends acknowledge, accepted their friends as they were, um, they also and, and responded to changes in, in, a night, in a kind way, as we'll see in the next theme, uh, they also really worked to treat the friend the same way that they always had. So they treated them with dignity, respect, and kindness. Uh, and that helped the friends to reframe how they thought about that relationship. While memory changes impacted the lives of the people who were living with dementia in the study, they expressed a wish to be treated the same as they were before their diagnosis and their friends honored that preference. So in the, the top quote on the slide, we see how Carol focused on treating her friend the same uh, with the same amount of respect and dignity, and dignity that she did before the diagnosis. And Ada's quote shows again more of that process where she actively reminded herself to treat her friend Anna the same by acknowledging that Anna was still Anna, even with memory loss. So this quote reminds us that the process of changing the way we think about the friendship was not always easy and it did require some time and effort to do so. So the third theme uh, related to shifting thinking about our friendship, again, uh, is about practicing patience and kindness. So although the participants emphasized the importance of treating one's friend the same, they also had to respond in different ways and adapt their behavior to accommodate changes in cognition. They were patient with their friends, they were kind with their friends, even when that patient, patience was tested. So in the top quote, Carol here is speaking about having to slow down in order to help her friend um, kind of keep up with the conversation or the activities that were going on. And in the second quote, Walter talks about exercising patience and kindness for his friend. Here he says that he treated the, his friend the same as they always did, but he's willing to be more patient and kind than he might have been otherwise. No, I'm quite willing to listen to the same story time and again as if it's new to me. You can imagine how that can test someone's patience. Uh, yet these friends were, were willing to listen to those stories over and over again. The next theme related or sub theme related to shifting um, thinking about the friendship was about uh, prioritizing one's friend over one's own feelings. And again, this was more relevant to the friend without dementia. Uh, so they acknowledged um, the grief that they experienced because of the changes that their friend was going through, but they also felt that it was more important to focus on the friend dementia. It's not about my feelings. It's not about my pain of this loss. It's about being there for her um, and being able to support her as she is right now. So Flo and Chloe were both um, friends of Anna who had that, that larger group interview um, and Anna had a more advanced dementia. Uh, than some of the other participants, you can really see these quotes, um, how they really work to prioritize uh, Anna over their own feelings. So the final uh, example or the final sub theme related to shifting thinking about the friendship related to uh, kind of goes back to the, the previous around reciprocity and really drawing on each other's strengths within these friendships. Uh, so focusing on strengths and abilities rather than losses allowed for a mutual exchange of support. 
So previously I shared um, Janet and Kathleen's exchanges uh, of reciprocity on the previous uh, few slides ago, uh, and they really did rely on each other by drawing on each other's strengths. So uh, they both like to go to the symphony together and Janet who didn't have dementia kept track of the tickets Whereas uh, Kathleen, who was still at that time able to drive, provided the transportation to and from the symphony. So they were able to rely on each other by drawing on each other's strengths. Participants also focused on uh, strengths like long-term memory as well as interest in music and a sense of humor to continue to enjoy spending time together and to honor the person who was living with dementia. So on the, in the quote on this slide, Ed talks about you know, uh, his friend's long-term memory is, is still okay and they can go out for a beer and have that sense of humor and enjoy each other's company uh, despite the, the changes in memory and behavior that were occurring. Okay, so the last um, theme of this, of weathering change uh, is about addressing um, changes related to dementia through practical strategies. And there were three main strategies that the participants used, uh, being open and honest with each other about dementia, being able to step in to support the person with dementia and being persistent. So participants, uh, including both uh, friends, including care partners and people with dementia, felt that honesty with each other about memory loss was vital for sustaining these friendships. The participants uh, with dementia were open about their diagnosis and they were open about their needs and what kind of support they needed. Uh, so by being open and relying on each other, they were able to you know, ask for the, the support that they needed. And here, Kathleen, talks about the importance of honesty regarding her diagnosis. By being open with Janet, she doesn't have to worry if she can't remember something. She can simply ask for the reminders and the support from Janet. Friends in particular focused on identifying ways to provide support that were both subtle and kind. So they simply kept an eye out for their friend with dementia, particularly if they were in a new place. Uh, where they might feel lost or confused, um, or they provided gentle reminders when they needed to do so. So here in this quote, Carol talks about how she supports Patty by just giving gentle hints and just watching out to see if she needs some extra support. You know, she talks about, I'm looking for the expression on her face, and then I try to jump in. You know, I try not to make her feel bad, but just give her a, a subtle hint to help her kind of find the information that she needs in her, in her book. The final practical strategy just related to being persistent. So uh, friends in particular were persistent and they try not to give up on their friend with dementia, even if they forgot to call them back or uh, forgot to do an activity that they would normally do together. Uh, they really just, um, stuck with it and, and learned to be persistent with them in providing those reminders, uh, you know, making sure people had activities written down in their calendars, not waiting around for the person with dementia to call to make plans, but going ahead and kind of taking the lead on that. So in the quote here, uh, John's friend with dementia, they were both living in long-term care uh, and John would go and visit his friend and, um, when she didn't want to go to an activity that she would enjoy, he knew she would enjoy, he would, you know, he wouldn't take no for an answer. He would uh, encourage her to attend with him and, and enjoy the music that he talks about here in this quote. So um, that kind of wraps up the three main themes and their associated uh, sub-themes that we found in this particular uh, aspect of the study. So we found that by using these strategies, participants created supportive spaces within their relationships to both honor and continue the commitment to their friendships. Further, by drawing on these strategies, friends in particular were able to acknowledge that despite changes in memory and behavior, their friend with dementia was a person who had thoughts, feelings, and strengths. Participants prioritized their friendships by spending time together and connecting with each other in meaningful ways. 
their shared interests uh, are a hallmark of, of strong friendships. And for our participants, prioritizing personal contact may have provided a foundation for shifting ways of thinking about the friendship and adopting those practical strategies that I discussed earlier. Acknowledging that the friend with dementia may need additional support, but was still the same person, may have facilitated friends' willingness and efforts to adjust their behavior to better meet the needs of the individual with dementia, as well as the friendship as a whole. Similar to previous research, participants with dementia in this study wish to be treated the same as they were before the diagnosis, and friends adapted, adopted strategies that both recognized and allowed for adaptation to changes while respecting the friend who was living with dementia and their preferences. Finally, our study supports previous research regarding the importance of reciprocity in friendships and highlighted that both the person living with dementia and their friend contributed to and benefited from these ongoing friendships. So I started the discussion today with some um, thoughts on stigma and dementia. So I just wanna return to that here before I uh, share some practical implications. And I think that uh, our friends or our participants' willingness and their ongoing effort to maintain friendships to us suggested that participants um, with dementia and without dementia didn't really buy into the tragedy discourse of dementia. Instead, the strategies presented here suggest that many people living with dementia and their friends may resist the common stereotypes that are associated with dementia. So sustaining friendships after a diagnosis may be one means of counteracting this tragedy discourse and challenging the stigma that exists. As these friends did focus on strengths, reciprocity and mutual benefit. So there are several practical implications of this study that I'll explore on the next couple of slides. Uh, and I think I'll start kind of with community-based services. There, there are implications for formal and informal service providers, such as dementia education programs and dementia support groups, which could start to include education on the value of maintaining friendships after a diagnosis, as well as a discussion of strategies that can be used to maintain friendships. Uh, the formal and informal service providers can also provide opportunities for friends to come together uh, and discuss their desires and have that kind of open communication about what they need and what they want from the friendship. Finally, community-based leisure programs may facilitate opportunities for friends to spend time together in activities that are mutually um, beneficial or enjoyable. There are also um, several implications for long-term care facilities. Even though we didn't uh, have a, a huge part of our sample that uh, had moved into long-term care, I think we can still make some um, inferences about what long-term care homes may be able to do to support friendships. I think one thing they can do is simply um, provide opportunities for friends to interact by including participants in formal and in, or sorry, friends, in formal and informal uh, leisure opportunities. Often family members are invited to birthday parties or holiday celebrations, but I, I don't think friends really would are invited all that often or considered within long-term care. Uh, long-term care staff can also incorporate uh, photos and mementos celebrating friendship within the person with dementia's uh, living space as a reminder of the importance of that friendship in long-term care. And staff may also benefit from drawing on friends' knowledge of, of residents. What's, what's their history? What are their strengths? What were their uh, desires, how do they live their life, those kinds of things. And um, staff may get that information from family members as well, but I think our friends see maybe a different side of us than our family members do. And so they might be able to add additional insight there. So in terms of future research, uh, I think a more longitudinal exploration of friendship over time would lend greater insight into how the process of maintaining friendship does shift as dementia progresses, particularly with a move into long-term care. 
could also consider different types of friendship and whether the type of friendship has an impact on the amount of support or the ability to sustain the friendship. So are friends uh, that friendships that are developed in the workplace different than friendships that are uh, developed based on shared leisure interests? Uh, we didn't consider gender within this study, but it, uh, it might be worth consideration of gender and how that might impact how people view or experience their friendships. And I think what, you know, we really tried to take a strengths-based approach to this research. Uh, and I think that perhaps in doing so, uh, in part to kind of combat the stigma of dementia that exists, uh, we may have uh, left out the voices of people who do have a more difficult time sustaining friendships. So broadening the participant pool to perhaps include more people who struggled with friendships uh, would be beneficial. So um, knowledge translation is an important part of research. So we really wanted to be able to share this information with people with dementia and their friends, as well as family care partners. And so we, um, we we're creating a series of videos based on the findings, uh, really short videos that kind of highlight the main themes of the study. And so you're gonna have an opportunity, this is it, the, our short film debut here today. So you guys are the first to see this outside of the research team. And I'm just gonna try to share a different screen with you so you can, can watch the video here. Friendship in dementia contributes to well-being, social connectedness, and quality of life. And yet, once someone is diagnosed with dementia, their risk of social isolation increases. People who have been diagnosed with dementia wish to remain engaged with family and community, and they experience meaning in doing so. Despite the importance of social support and social engagement for people living with dementia, little is known about how long-term friendships are maintained after a diagnosis. In this video, we share a real life story and strategies for maintaining friendships with a person with dementia. Claudia and I have been friends for 30 years. When Claudia started having trouble with her memory, I knew it was important to maintain our connection with one another. We both made an effort to prioritize our friendship by chatting on the phone and going out for coffee and talking about the family. We try to spend time together periodically so we don't lose touch and it helps create a sense of normalcy. Even though Claudia has challenges with her memory, I still rely on her and she is still always there for me. I've learned to think about my friendship with Claudia in new ways. She's still the same person and has told me that she wants to be treated the same way. I think we have to remember that when someone's brain isn't firing as fast as it once did, well then, we need to slow down. I'm careful to be patient and kind if she forgets something or acts differently than before. Once, out at a restaurant, Claudia forgot how to use her fork. I gently reminded Claudia how to use her fork without making a big deal about it. We later laughed about the incident together. But still, I felt a sense of grief at this loss of memory. It can be devastating to have a strong friendship and no longer have it reciprocated. But I want to be her friend no matter what. I've developed some practical strategies for maintaining our friendship. When I want to spend time with Claudia, I no longer wait for her to call me. When I call her now, I am more direct. I don't say, call me if you want to do this. Instead, I say, do you want to do this? Put it in your calendar. With openness and honesty, I can step in to provide support for Claudia. Like yesterday, when I helped her plant her garden. 
She had forgotten how to plant her marigolds, and so I showed her how to place them in the soil and cover up the roots. By finding ways to support her and honor her strengths, we still have a joyful and fulfilling friendship. By using these strategies, people living with dementia and their friends created supportive spaces within their relationships to both honor and continue their long-term commitment to the friendship. These strategies allow friends to acknowledge that despite changes in memory and behavior, their friend with dementia is a person who has thoughts, feelings, and strengths. So that was, uh, we're trying to do a series of three. The other two are still um, being developed. So kind of, we're hoping that we can share that uh, more widely with the public so that uh, they can perhaps identify some strategies that might be useful for their individual situation that might help maintain friendship after a diagnosis. So to conclude my presentation today, uh, we learned from this research that friendships can be sustained by adopting a variety of strategies that uphold dignity of the individual with dementia through acceptance, acknowledgement of strengths and through practical and emotional strategies aimed at adapting to changes. These friendships may provide much needed social support to people living with dementia and they offer an opportunity to move away from the negative uh, discourse that's too often associated with a diagnosis of dementia. I just wanted to take a second to acknowledge uh, all the fantastic people who have helped us out with this research. We had several research assistants at each uh, institution, um, along with the Alzheimer's Society who helped us recruit participants. And uh, Tracy and Dylan were um, the people that created the video for us since we do not have those skills at all. So they, we wrote the script, but they did all of the art for that.